The cross is one of the most powerful symbols known to humanity. Whenever you see a cross, you automatically think of the church. But that's not how it was always viewed. During ancient times, the cross was a symbol of oppression and a reminder of what happened to nonconformists. How can something made of wood and used to torture and torment thousands of people become a sign that can be identified as hope, help, and healing? Join us as we dive into the meaning of the cross. Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see you all this morning. We are continuing in our sermon series about the meaning of the cross. And this is the cool thing that we're doing is we're taking multiple Sundays to talk about the meaning of the cross. And Pastor Todd kicked us off and Pastor Des has had the last couple of weeks. And what it, the cool thing about this is that a lot of times as believers, we tend to just settle in on one meaning of the cross. So you ask the average Christian, you know, what, what's the cross mean to you? Um, they would say, well, Jesus paid the price for my sins. That's true. But, um, of course, <clears throat> there's more than that. There's more than one meaning. Because any time you try to get at what God is, who God is, and what God does, you can only scratch the surface. And so there are, there's more than one meaning. There's more than one thing that actually happened when Jesus went to the cross. And so we are doing something that the theologians call stringing pearls here. We are lining up these precious truths one week after another so that we can look at them all at once and just be amazed. And so today... For a third time, we're going to talk about what the cross means to us as believers. Pastor Todd kicked it off by talking about what the cross meant to Jesus. Pastor Des kept it going, talking for two weeks about what the cross means to us as believers. And so for the third time, we're going to talk about that again. So as Des said, yeah, it means absolutely deliverance from the power of sin. Yes, it means liberation, both physically and spiritually, Today we're going to talk, though, about the lengths, the lengths to which God's love will go. And we're going to start to just scratch the surface of how deep and wide God's love is for us. So let's start here. If we're honest, if we're honest, we all want to know how much we're loved, right? We all want to know that. And it starts when we're really, really little, when we're babies, because we play that little game, you know, how much does daddy love you? And you teach the baby this much, right? So just from the beginning, we're quantifying already another's love for us. How much? How much? Then we grow up a little bit. We start talking about love languages. Oh, her love language is giving gifts. You know, she likes to give gifts. She likes to receive gifts. Or his love language are words of admiration. You know, if he, if he speaks good words, that means he loves you. You know, her love language is physical touch. Love language, love language. What that all boils down to, though, is still the question, how do I know when somebody really loves me? So how much? So we all know, we know that our parents love us. We know that our spouses, our friends, our siblings, our kids, they love us. But how much do they love us? Do they love us a little bit? Do they love us a lot? Is it reluctant? Is it hesitant? How much do they love me? How far does it really go? How far are they willing to go? And I find this really interesting as I think about the way that my parents or my spouse have loved me. My parents loved me their whole lives. They fed me, they clothed me, they housed me, they put me through school. That's big love. So why is it that the little episodes where they go to great lengths for me stand out to me? You know, like the time my mom stayed up all night typing my term paper when I was a freshman and I procrastinated. I also couldn't type, so she stays up all night typing. That stands out to me. It also stands out to me that when my kids were little, my dad drove 200 miles to babysit them for a couple of days because nobody else was available. That stands out to me, how far he would go. And then there's this one. So for 38 years, my husband Chris has been loving me. He's been serving me in countless ways. So why does this episode stand out? The time when we had only gone out just a couple of times, we really weren't dating yet, but we, we did go to the same church in our college town. And I'm walking home from church one day, and I've gotten about a block away from church, and I see out of the corner of my eye that he's following me. He's trying to catch up to me. And I admit, I wanted to know, how badly does he want to catch up to me? 
So I start walking a little faster, and he keeps up. I have really long legs. I can walk pretty fast, so I walked a little faster. And the, the poor guy, he's, got, he's also carrying this big, heavy trombone case because he had played in the brass group that morning in, in church. But he walks faster. Finally, I just turn it on. I walk as fast as I can, and I look back, and he has started to run. He's running. And that was the moment I knew I was going to marry him, even though it took me months longer to admit it. But that was when I knew, because the guy was willing to run with a heavy trombone case to catch up to me. And here's the thing. It's not any different than our relationship with God. We know from the Bible, we know intellectually, yes, God loves me, for God so loved the world. We know that verse. Yes, I know, you know, we even know that as broken people, God still loved us. But how far is God willing to go? How much does God really love me? And what does that have to do with the cross? So I want to I wanna kick us off in um, John chapter 13. We're going to read John chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. You've got your pew Bible in front of you. You can turn to page 1069, 1069, if you want to join me. John 13, verses 1 through 8. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So this is a familiar story to those of us who've been in the church for any length of time. This is a passage that gets preached often during Holy Week on Holy Thursday. It's the story of Jesus and his disciples. They're at the Last Supper. And at the Last Supper, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He does this extraordinary thing. And as he's working his way around the table, everyone seems to be okay with receiving this extraordinary act of service until, of course, he gets to Peter. And, of course, Peter, being Peter, says, what are you doing? And Jesus says, what I'm doing, you don't understand now, but you will. You'll get it later. And Peter, always creating drama, but also always standing in for the rest of us, he says, oh, no, 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 Jesus. No, you will never wash my feet. Don't do that. And Jesus says, if you don't let me, you don't have any share with me. So we know this story, but what I think gets overlooked very frequently is verse 1. And so I want to go back to that. That is the beginning of the story. This is where the writer, John, is going to make a big pivot, okay? And this pivot is is big in two ways. First of all, he is turning us to the next four chapters. Chapters 13 through 17, as you remember, it's a very long dinner speech. Jesus' last instructions to his disciples. It's also, though, John's pivot toward the rest of the gospel. It is toward the cross, toward the crucifixion, and ultimately the resurrection. So let's read it one more time. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father... Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What does that even mean? He loved them to the end. Well, before we go any farther, I know some of you are detail-oriented. I, I know a few of you well enough to know that you're looking at that verse and you're going, it says he loved them to the end. Them. So that has nothing to do with us, right? Well, that would be wrong. That would be wrong because, again, this is the intro into a big, long dinner speech, okay, that's going to end 
in John 17. So you got to go all the way to the end of John 17, John 17, 20. You'll see Jesus ends this speech by including all who will come to faith, all who will come to know Jesus because of the witness of these 12 people. That includes you, okay? So we have present the starter kit, but you're included as well. So if you could have skipped all the generations that it was going to take for you to be born in the 20th or the 21st century and could time travel, he would have washed your feet too. He would have washed your feet too. So he's washing their feet, but he's thinking of you, he's thinking of me. Okay, so he's loving them and he's loving us. So then, does loving them and us to the end, does that mean getting down on his hands and knees and washing their feet? Is that what John means when he says love them to the end? Or does he mean love them to the end of the story? Or, or, or what, is, what does that even mean? So let's look at the word end. And the word end here is the word telos, which is Greek, and this is the Greek word from which we get telescope, okay? So the root tell or tell us, it just means reaching the end. And I brought a little prop here for you today. I brought a toy telescope, um, a little pirate spyglass. And I want to illustrate to you what tell us looks like. And that is that you can unfold it, right? One stage at a time until it's functioning at full strength, full capacity, full completeness, total completeness. It reaches, you've reached the end, you've reached the goal. That is the word that John is using to describe how far the lengths of Jesus' love. Now remember that Jesus says to Peter, you don't get it right now, you don't understand right now, but later you will understand. The act of foot, foot washing is just foreshadowing how far Jesus will go. So how far would he go? So. One of the things I love about the Bible is that there are, you can look to another passage to help shine light on the one that you're reading. Now, I don't know. We don't know exactly which writers of the Bible read the other writers of the Bible and whether they're intentionally you know, interacting with it. Some we know they are. But, but what we know for sure is that the Holy Spirit drove all of these people. The Holy Spirit was directing all of these people. And if you look at one passage, sometimes it'll help you see what's going on in another one. So I want to show you something that Paul wrote. Paul, who spent a lot of time thinking about God's love for us through Jesus. And he lays out in Philippians, he lays out the telos, or the length, the end of God's love. He doesn't use that word, but that's what he's doing. And, in, and I want to show you this, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." And so if you read that passage, you can almost see the telescope extending here, right? First, Jesus leaves heaven as God to become uh, human, to become God with us. And we don't need to deep dive into that today because we do that every December during Advent, right? We know that God becomes God with us in and through Jesus. And then he becomes a servant, a divine but human servant. And this is exactly what he's acting out as he's washing their feet. Then Paul says, though he went even further than that, this divine human went to his death as God with us, and he didn't just die a human death. He died the worst death that a human being can imagine. Torture, humiliation, sacrifice. So if we, if we grab my telescope again, you look at the lengths to which God would go out of love for us is to take on human form, then the form of a servant, then to go to his death. And if I had one more in my little toy telescope, we'd get that one all important one, even death on a cross. That's how far, that's how far he would go. And think about this, once you are God and you've limited yourself to human form, you can't go any farther than death on a cross. That's as far as you can go for love. That is as far as you can go. And that's how far he went. Greater love, has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You've heard that before. Do you know who said that? Jesus. 
Jesus said that. Do you know when Jesus said that? Jesus said that just a few minutes after he washed their feet in the same dinner speech, John 13 to 17. He explained telos in that. He explained the full strength of his love. He said there isn't any greater love than somebody who's willing to lay down his life. And as we've heard over the last few weeks, that's what Jesus did. He laid down his life. He died on a cross to deliver you from the power of sin, to liberate you both spiritually and physically, to hand you the incredible cup of salvation and to show you just how far and wide and deep and high his love for you will go. This is God's love language. This is God's love language. So Paul just, Paul wonders about this, and I, and I do mean wonder, in Ephesians 3, where he prays for the Ephesians. He says, I pray that you would know, that you would understand the breadth and the length and the width and the height of God's love through Jesus. And it's one of, the, the, one of those things that, that that love is so big that we're back to stringing pearls, right? You could just talk about all the different ways that Jesus loved us all day long, and we still wouldn't even get close to describing how big the love is. So we could stop there. Um, we could. That's, that's it. Except it's not the end of the story. Because today we're talking about the meaning of the cross for us, and As we saw in John 13, it was important to Jesus that Peter and the other disciples decide what they were going to do about that love, and it's important to Jesus that we decide. So I want to go back for a second to John 13. You remember how Jesus works his way around the table washing feet until he gets to Peter? All the other disciples seem to be okay with it. They seem to be willing to receive this service from Jesus, which I find really interesting because this has never happened before. This is extraordinary that their rabbi, their teacher, their leader, the one that they learn from and that they follow and they listen to is down on his hands and knees washing the dirt off their calloused heels and their filthy toes. But obviously most of them, they must have trusted him in that moment because it says he he went around the table until he got to Peter. Peter wasn't gonna go there. And Jesus says to him, if I don't, if you don't let me, then you can't have a part in me. And that scares Peter. We didn't read this part, but Peter, Peter's like, okay, 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 you know, give me a whole bath. Give me a whole bath. Which, you know, we tend to laugh at that part of the story, but here's the thing. Peter represents all of us. And so um, I want to say this to us. There are some here, I know there are some here who have been raised Lutheran, and you have heard that message of grace just preached at you constantly, and if you had been there that night, you might find yourself sitting around the table with the other disciples, with James and John and Thomas and Bartholomew, and you'd be like, yeah, bring it on, Jesus, bring it on. But I also know there are plenty of us in this room, plenty of us, whether we were raised Lutheran or Baptist or Catholic or maybe Mennonite, who struggle with not being good enough to receive God's love. And so we hold Jesus at arm's length, and we go, no, 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 no. You know, my feet are too dirty. You know, I'm not good enough, Jesus. No, no. I have have metaphorical athlete's foot, you know, between my metaphorical toes. Don't, don't, don't. And what I think Jesus is saying to us this morning is the same thing he said to Peter. He's looking at you with kindness in his eyes, but he's also dead serious. And he's saying, my friend, if you aren't willing to receive my love, to believe that I really love you, that I loved you to the end, that I went as far as a human being could go for you, you can't go along with me on this ride. I want you to have it all, Jesus says, but you have to let me love you. So we have a ministry map here at Good Shepherd, and it lays out the pattern of our discipleship. And it's a, it's a triangle, and it says receive, respond, redirect. And you see the little arrows, and it's kind of this circular thing. It kind of represents this, this, the fact that we have to go around this many times in our discipleship. Receive, respond, redirect. We have to receive God's love. We receive his love through what Jesus did for us on the cross. We respond to that. Instead of being like Peter and going, no, 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 we have to receive and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 
And then we respond by following him, by sitting at his feet in study and prayer. And then the Holy Spirit, as we mature, redirects us into ministry. And we learn what it is to lay down our life for our friends. And then we'll do it again because we are always having to receive. Today is a day to receive. Today is a day to receive that love. And I wanna say this to you, whether it is the first time you're actually receiving God's love or it's the thousandth time. And here's the thing, if it's the thousandth time, those 999 other times, they count. Of course they do. It's all part of, like Paul said, beginning to grasp the breadth and the width and the height and the length and the, all those descriptors of Jesus' love. It takes a lifetime. So I just kind of wonder how many of us are going through our days, walking around Sacramento, fully aware of how much God loves you, fully receiving that love, not just the love of God as he became human, not just the love of God as he came to serve, not just even the love of Jesus as he died, but as he died, that passionate death, that passionate love gift on the cross And I wonder, have you let that passionate love cut through your heart recently? You know, a lot of us feel numb after the last couple of years. A lot of us are dealing with depression and gloom and apathy. How often do we just let that love of Jesus just cut through all that noise? I want to close with a a story. So, um, Brennan Manning... Uh, was a former Catholic priest. He was a devout follower of Jesus. And he was also a very popular Christian speaker for a number of years. And the message that Brennan was given to share, his, the call in his life was to share the overwhelming love of Jesus. And he did it extremely well. He also loved to tell a story. And I'm sharing this with you because it's such a powerful example of the fact that even after walking with Jesus for a very long time, we still get to the point where we have to actually receive that love. So Brennan is um, in redirect mode in this story. He's ministering, he's actively ministering, and in this story he has just finished a weekend retreat where he's delivered a number of powerful messages through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's celebrating. By the time he gets to the airport on Monday morning, he's gonna fly out of Louisiana, he's gonna go to Philadelphia, He's just praising God for all the ways that God worked. But by the time he got on the plane, the enemy was now attacking him, which is not uncommon. When, you've, when God's used you in a powerful way, the enemy will attack. And the enemy says, Brennan, you are such a phony. Those are just great words, man, but they don't even begin to match your life. You're such a hypocrite. And because Brennan's just emotionally exhausted, depression just settles all over him, just this big, dark gloom. And so he he makes his connecting flight in Chicago, and on top of the gloom and doom, he finds out he's got a long layover. Ugh. So he remembers he's got this friend, actually a second mom, his name is, her name is Mrs. Brennan, and so he decides he's gonna go visit Mrs. Brennan. Now it may strike you as odd that Brennan Manning is gonna go visit Mrs. Brennan, and you're right, there is a reason they both have the same name. Mrs. Brennan had a son named Ray Brennan, and Ray was Manning's best friend in boot camp all the way into the Korean War. Ray was also the one who, in 1952, selflessly threw himself on a grenade and saved Manning's life. And the way uh, Manning tells this story is that Ray threw himself on the grenade, it detonated, it blew out most of his torso, and he had just long enough before he died to look up at Manning and wink at him, and then he dies. So fast forward to Brennan Manning becoming a priest, And as he's taking his monastic vows and entering into the order, he takes a new first name. And he decides to take a name, the name Brennan. His name had been Richard. Brennan Manning. To remind him that he's living a life of self-sacrifice. He also adopted Ray's mom as his second mother. So now he's in Chicago. This is where Mrs. Brennan lives. So he decides, I'm going to go visit her. Mrs. Brennan's 84, she lives by herself, she's thrilled to see him, she makes him dinner, 
And then she's got a lot to say. She's got a lot to catch up on. So they're sitting on the couch, and she's just chattering away, telling all kinds of stories. And he listens for a while, but then he checks out because he's just sinking back into that gloom and that depression. And finally, he interrupts her, and he goes, Ma, do you, do you think Ray really loved me? And she looks at him with a little fear in her eyes, and she goes, oh, stop. And he goes, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. Do you really think Ray loved me? Well, she lowers her head for a second, and she's silent. And finally, she says to him, don't you ever talk to me like that again. Don't you ever speak about my Raymond like that again. You stop making fun of me. And then she stands up, and she's seething. And she looks him in the eye, and she goes, Jesus Christ, man, what more could he have done for you? Now, that's a powerful story. I remember the first time I heard that story, and I was scandalized. I could feel that mama's pain. Can't you? I was just scandalized that, that, that Brennan Manning could have the audacity to ask if Ray really loved him. But Brennan Manning told this story, and I'm telling you this story because we do it all the time. Every time I wonder where I stand with God, every time I wonder, how much do you really love me? I mean, do you really love me? How far are you really willing to go? I put the Father of Jesus in pain and frustration. And I think for those of us, when we do that, the Father of Jesus is saying, Jesus Christ, my son. He's saying, man, woman, Sandy, Todd, Sway, what more could he have done for you? Nobody, not your mom, not your dad, not your partner, not your friend, nobody ever loved you or will love you with the love that Jesus loves you. He went as far as he could go. He went as far as he could go. He is the Ray Brennan of our lives. But he didn't just die and wink at us, and that was the end. He died, he saved us, he's still alive, he's still loving us, and he will love us to the end. So would you just close your eyes for a second? I, I, I would like you to just, if you can, just picture yourself in that upper room at the Last Supper, and, and Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just open our eyes to see Jesus in our mind's eye. And Jesus is working his way around the table, and he's washing the feet of the disciples. And he sees you as you linger on the sidelines. And he motions you over to a chair. And now he's coming over to you to wash your feet too. And he looks up in your eyes to see if you're willing to let him. And when you look in his eyes, all you can see is kindness and a little knowing smile. But there is also steel in his gaze because he's very serious. And he says to you, will you let me love you? Will you? I've already gone way past foot washing, friend. I've already died for you even on a cross. That is how much I love you. Will you let me love you? Will you let me love you? And just take a minute to answer that question. Will you let him love you? We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for loving us not just a little and not even just a lot, but with everything you had to give. And we thank you that that love continues to flow through us by your spirit. Would you just keep showing us, would you keep teaching us that we might not just know with our heads, but with every fiber in our being, the depths and the heights and the breadths and the lengths of your love. And it's in your name we pray, amen.